Hello, everybody. I am Cheryl Gedelman, board member of tre and treasurer of Chad of Northern Virginia. Welcome to our lecture series, which is once a month on Tuesday evening. I am pleased to introduce Patric Dr. Patricia Quinn, who will be speaking about a topic you may not have heard much about, a woman's journey with ADHD. Patricia Quinn, MD, is a developmental pediatrician and a well-known international speaker who conducts workshops on the many aspects of diagnosing and treating ADHD. Since 1999, she has devoted her attention professionally to the issues confronting girls and women with ADHD. In addition, she has authored several best-selling and groundbreaking books on the topic, including Understanding Girls with ADHD, 100 Questions and Answers about ADHD in Women and Girls, and Attention Girls, a guide to learn all about your ADHD. In 2000, Dr. Quinn received the Chad Hall of Fame Award for her work in these areas. And I'm going to welcome Dr. Quinn. Thank you, Cheryl. Um, I'm really excited to be here this evening because so often um, this topic, as with the recognition and diagnosis in women, um, is overlooked. So uh, let's get started because we have a lot of territory to cover. Um, I'm going to be uh, covering four um, specific areas um, tonight. The first three deal with um, the disorder in women, what it looks like, how it's different, um, uh, various consequences of late diagnosis or the diagnosis. Um, and then we're going to be talking in the fourth section about treatment specific to women. And I think that's important because so often, as in a lot of medical research, um, this disorder and the medications to treat it really um, have not been tested in women until recently. And also we need to look at other areas as far as uh, the treatment of women because the disorder is so different in women um, than in men or boys. Um, so we're talking a little bit about girls also, because I think that's important. Um, one of the things that was I always found interesting when uh, Dr. Nadeau and I and Dr. Uh, Littman wrote Understanding Girls with ADHD in 1999, um, we've revised it since, but when we first wrote it, a lot of women read it because it was the only book out there that told them their story. And um, I think that was fascinating because they, they saw how it was like for them growing up and um, the, the um, symptoms, et cetera. And a lot of women found the book very, um, I don't know if it's reassuring, but they found the book really enlightening um, and very helpful. Um, okay, so let's get started. Uh, first of all, um, ADHD is an equal opportunity disorder. Uh, as much as men, this is not a sex-linked disorder, so we don't see it preferentially in one sex versus the other. Now, as far as earlier diagnoses years ago, we did find um, more boys and men with the disorder because that's who people were studying. Uh, this is a disorder who in the 70s um, was based on the symptoms found in elementary school age white boys under 12. And as a result, people thought this was a disorder of um, only children and boys specifically. And so the ratios of men, uh, boys to girls was about 10 to 1 for many years. Um, that's come down a lot. The ratios of women to men are now equal. And there's no reason why we shouldn't see this disorder in equal numbers. We've been missing a lot of girls and women along the way. So let's talk about why, why have we been missed? Why have women been overlooked? Um, the reason for that is, is based on what I was just talking about. The symptoms of the disorder, as it defined the disorder, uh, was what was seen objectively in hyperactive elementary school age boys. And that's not how most girls and women present. There are some girls who have hyperactive only type or who are very hyperactive or hyper talkative, um, but their symptoms even in that realm don't present exactly the same way. 
So when we look at the symptoms, they present very differently. They have the same symptoms. You have to be inattentive. You have to um, have difficulty with impulsivity, distractibility, uh, attention span, et cetera, to have the disorder. Um, so you have to have some of those symptoms, but they may not look the same. For example, with hyperactivity, um, we don't, again, we see early on a lot of hyperactivity, but in very small children, um, preschoolers, the studies were done many years ago that showed boys with ADHD were hyperactive, girls with ADHD were shy and withdrawn. And that was an interesting finding, but no one ever followed up on it. As we started looking at adults with the disorder in the late 80s, um, Paul Wender started looking at adults. And when we started shifting the focus from hyperactivity to inattentiveness, and then later on to executive functioning disorders, we started expanding and seeing the disorder in many more people because we weren't focusing on just the hyperactivity. Now, for boys who are hyperactive, we often find that they're out of their seats, they're, uh, you know, with the pencil sharpener, and a lot of times no one knows where they are. Um, girls with ADHD may be moving around a lot, have their shoes off, be twisting their pigtails. Um, they may be up on their knees, on their desk, you know, kind of in the space of the person in front of them, but they're not out of their chair. They're not out of their seat. So they're not up and away, which is one of, again, the symptoms that you look at for this disorder. Um, so we see that as a difference. We find also that girls and women with ADHD may be hyper talkative, um, not hyperactive. The other thing that I I found is that they're often hyper reactive um, so that the girls, the adolescent girls and young women will say, I don't know how I'm going to be at any moment, how I'm going to react to a situation, um, whether something's going to set me off or, or what's going to happen. So we see a lot of um, hyper reactivity, hyper um, talkativeness, but it's not the same as um, hyperactivity as a motor overactivity. Um, the other thing that we see very often is that girls and women um, particularly have the inattentive type or the combined type. And for that, very often, we don't, they don't call attention to themselves. Uh, so they're really not the squeaky wheels in the classroom. And therefore, teachers aren't referring them um, for an evaluation because they don't demonstrate the symptoms. Now, over the years, I've talked to many teachers. Um, I have them fill out the Connors rating scale. And I remember seeing a girl, we'll call her Susan, and uh, she definitely had ADHD as far as I was concerned. Um, and when her teacher sent back the Connors scale, it said, not at all, not at all, not at all, not at all. And I said, what's going on here? I know this girl's having all these difficulties. So I called the teacher up on the phone. They happened to be from New Jersey. And I called the teacher up on the phone and I said, um, you know, I just evaluated Susan and I find she's having some difficulties in certain areas. Um, can you tell me why you rated this form the way you did? And the teacher said, well, she doesn't have to have ADHD. She just needs to learn to pay attention and stop talking. And I went, oh, <laughs> uh, again, this teacher did not recognize that constant talking and not paying attention was ADHD in this girl. Um, I've also heard teachers say to me, oh, she couldn't possibly have ADHD. She has such a nice smile and she's such a nice girl. So this is what happens very often. So we're not picking up the diagnosis early. Um, as time goes on, um, we find a, um, complications or coexisting conditions start to raise their heads. Uh, first of all, uh, this is a disorder that usually does not travel alone. 70% um, of the individuals with ADHD usually have a coexisting condition or uh, issues. Uh, we find that for girls and women, um, their disorder is an internalizing disorder. It affects them. When we talk about boys and men, uh, it seems that this disorder is more externalizing. By that I mean their behaviors bother other people 
for girls and women, their behaviors bother them and affect them. Uh, examples that I use are if some uh, a female with ADHD fails a test, um, she will say, oh, I'm so stupid. If a male with ADHD fails the same test, he'll say, that was a stupid test. Again, externalizing versus internalizing. Uh, again, if someone um, really the, the, they're in trouble with the teacher or something's going on, they'll say, those people don't like me or the teacher doesn't like me uh, versus she's a stupid teacher or I don't like her or you know, whatever. So um, we see the differences and that causes um, some secondary problems for girls and women. Um, first of all, we see a lot of anxiety over their ADHD symptoms, not just generalized anxiety disorder, but we see that their symptoms cause them to realize what's going on and their failures and the problems they're having so, and, and how difficult things are for them versus other people. So they then think, oh, you know, I'm not as smart as everybody else. I'm having all these problems. I'm really worried. I didn't study for that test I, last time. I forgot about it. I wonder if there's anything else that I need to do now. Is there a test now that I should be doing? What should I be doing? And they develop a great deal of anxiety of, you know, I'm afraid this is going to happen to them once, and they're afraid that it's going to happen to them again. So they, they develop this anxiety over their symptoms cropping up and sabotaging or surprising them in, in various situations. Uh, so we do see that anxiety. We do see anxiety disorder in girls and women with ADHD as a coexisting condition. Um, so we may have someone who's very anxious early on, girl, and um, you know the physician or the parents may understand the anxiety and not know that she also has coexisting ADHD. Depression is really a significant problem for girls and women with ADHD. And coexisting depression is very common. However, there's also a demoralization associated with the disorder. If you think you're not smart, if you're, not, uh, if you're failing, if you have to work harder than everybody else, then you may feel that you really cannot do what everybody else can do and you get depressed or demoralized over this. I remember um, evaluating a 16-year-old girl and she came in and she was depressed and I said, well, how long have you been depressed? And she said, Oh, I, no, I asked her why she was depressed, and she said, well, it's because I'm really always failing in school no matter how hard I try. And then I said, well, you know, what's going on with school? And she said, well, I have trouble paying attention. And now she's 16, remember. And I said, well, how long have you had this trouble paying attention? And she said, I've had this trouble paying attention my whole life. No, nobody ever asked me about it. And that's another thing with girls and women. They look like they're paying attention. And they're looking, you know, they, they have um, pressure from society and uh, various societal norms that they try to live up to. And one of the things they do is that they look at the person speaking and therefore the person thinks they're paying attention. But their mind can be any place. So we have a lot of internal distractibility. Uh, where something may trigger them, uh, a thought, and then they're gone, and they're still looking at the person, and they have no idea. That also happens with reading. Very often, individuals with ADHD will be reading a text um, or a book or something, and then they'll realize, oh my gosh, I mean, this happens to everyone once in a while, but they say, oh, you know, I just read these 20 pages, and I have no idea what I just read, and so they have to go back and reread. Um, so we see that that issue with demoralization uh, is a big one, and you need to treat the ADHD to resolve all these issues to help with the anxiety and demoralization. Because if you don't treat the ADHD, things in their world do not get better. And ADHD is a life um, uh, disorder. Um, it's it's really, and again. It's very important not to think of this as an academic disorder. We've done that for much too long. Um, and this is a life issue. And it uh, really interferes uh, with our life and with being successful and reaching our potential. 
It's a very hopeful diagnosis, however, because once we're diagnosed, we can treat it. But it has a lot of implications for problems in girls and women. Um, they have, can have coexisting depression as well, unrelated to their ADHD, which as I said is very common. And as a result, people are pretty good um, at diagnosing uh, depression or seeing depression. Um, so that you'll find a physician um, or your internist or your psychiatrist that you're seeing or marital therapist or whatever says, you know, I think you're depressed. Um, and that's fine. Um, but if you have coexisting ADHD, you need to look, look a little further and treat the ADHD as well because you're still going to be having problems with organization, time management, um, prioritizing, completing uh, work. Uh, one mother uh, who was depressed and had been treated with ADA, uh, treated for her depression, and she came to see me to diagnose her ADHD. She said, "You know, um, I still have my ADHD symptoms, but I'm not depressed about them anymore." And that's again what happens. You know, the the, the antidepressant does its work. They're very effective, and they work on depressive symptomatology and you're no longer depressed, but you're still having trouble with all these other areas and you still can't function very well. Remember, ADHD is also a disorder that affects functioning. Um, you know, as I said, everybody has some of the symptoms of ADHD um, every once in a while, but those with ADHD have the preponderance of these symptoms most of the time. Um, it's very pervasive, these symptoms are pervasive in their life, and um, they also affect their functioning. So I think we can kind of say, okay, this is a, a really a life skill disorder. Um, to go along with this, we find again in women uh, and young girls, we find that many of them have eating disorders in addition to their ADHD. Many of them have um, intimate uh, partner abuse. We also see a lot of um, um, suicide ideation, suicide attempts. Uh, we also see self-mutilation uh, in these girls and women. And again, it's because of all the psychiatric trauma um, that they're experiencing from their ADHD and other symptomatology. There's a woman named Jane Adelizi, Dr. A-D-E-L-L-I-Z-I. -I. Uh, she's up outside of Boston, and she has written several um, papers and books on this topic with uh, women with learning disabilities and ADHD, saying they almost have a PTSD-like syndrome where they really have difficulty in uh, work later on because of all this trouble they've had in the academic setting, and maybe when they're going into a training course, or um, they, they have to have something done on time, or they know that what their project or whatever it is is going to be rated. Um, they have a great deal of difficulty with insomnia, um, GI symptoms, et cetera, um, because they have experienced so much trauma um, over their lifespan um, that they do have a reaction to uh, situations later on. Um, the other thing that we see with girls and women um, many, many years ago, um, we we're talking about, and we say, you know, women with ADHD have stayed in the closet for a long time. It's a very messy closet, but they stayed in there. And if in to their house or their life or their closet, no one knew. And we find that women really try to compensate for their symptoms. They try to hide them. They try uh, with a lot of coping mechanisms, asking for help. We find that women ask for help much more um, than boys and men. Uh, again, that may be a gender specific, but we do find that that helps them hide their ADHD. Um, a very high IQ also mitigates the symptomatology. So you can get great grades in school and still have all these problems with organization and time management. You know, you may be up till 2 o'clock every morning getting everything done, but you get an A and you make honor roll. Um, so that we find that women work very hard to compensate for their ADHD. They stay up very late. Um, they may select one area. Um, they develop 
obsessive compulsive personality disorder. Not OCD, but a personality disorder where they become obsessive compulsive in order to. I remember one woman who used to vacuum all the time. She would get very anxious um, as a result of having to do something uh, around her ADHD. So she would vacuum. So she would vacuum her house two and three times a day because that relieved her anxiety and her stress around her ADD symptomatology. So again, it's very important that we look at ADHD in women, we look for it in women, and that we look at the symptomatology a little bit differently. And we also look to see if some of these coexisting conditions are masking the ADHD, whether it's high IQ, uh, whether it's a lot of support, whether it's OCD tendencies, uh, or personality, um, whether it's depression masking their ADHD, and again, bipolar. We do see bipolar disorder in women with ADHD, and for many of them, they have ADHD as well. So when you treat the bipolar disorder, um, you don't diagnose the ADD. And for many women who have bipolar disorder, they get treated with two, three, four, five medications for their bipolar because all their symptoms are not reduced because their symptoms of ADHD have never been diagnosed and treated. So you can have both. You can have bipolar and ADHD. You need to treat the bipolar first so you don't increase the mania precipitate mania with these stimulants medications, but it's very important to also treat the ADHD. I have had several girls and women come to me who have been on many medications uh, for their bipolar disorder, and when they leave me, they're on one medication for their bipolar and one medication for their ADHD, um, working very effectively in tandem. So I think that's, again, very important. The coexisting conditions are there. Uh, if someone is diagnosed with one of these coexisting conditions, do they have ADHD in addition? Or is this coexisting um, uh, condition as a result of the ADHD not being treated? Or is it a primary condition that goes along with the ADHD um, and they're just running together? Um, so I think those are really two important areas. Um, now, uh, we also see that boys in school uh, can uh, have, or men, can have the inattentive type as well. I've been generalizing a lot with this disorder, but we see for some males, it's less than in females, but for some males who have just the inattentive symptomatology, just the inattentive type, they may have depression, they may have anxiety, they may have some of these symptoms as well uh, in, in the same um, presentation as I'm talking about with girls and women. But I want to stay with girls and women today um, because we're going to get into now another area that I think is really important in um, discussing this disorder in females. And that's hormones. Now, um, men have as much or probably more estrogen than women. Their estrogen is made in their liver from their uh, testosterone androgen from their male hormones and they do have uh, estrogen. And it's very stable. There are no estrogen fluctuations. And it stays very stable up to their 70s and 80s. Don't we wish that would have happened with us? Um, what we see for men uh, is that as a result, they don't have a lot of fluctuating symptomatology. That's not what we see with women we see a lot of fluctuating sim, uh, symptomatology where it's worse at sometimes, better, worsening in menopause, etc. So let's talk about that. Let's talk about estrogen. Why? Well, first of all, estrogen increases monoamine release at the synapse in the brain cells, in the neurons. Between two neurons, between two brain cells, there's a space in our brain, and that's called the synapse. And this brain cell secretes dopamine and norepinephrine and serotonin and a lot of other um, neurobiochemicals that 
are responsible for then stimulating the next cell to work and to, to, to make the sequences um, continue, path, neural path, pathways work. Okay, so what we see is that estrogen enhances monoamine release, that's dopamine, norepinephrine, and serotonin at the synapse by 20%. Okay, so if I'm a male and I have the same amount of estrogen every day, I'm going to have very um, stable um, monoamine release. If I'm a female, I have fluctuating hormones. First of all, as I enter adolescence, I may have floods of hormones. It may then be a period of time where it goes down and I have low hormones for a while. So we have widely fluctuating hormones um, <clears throat> during puberty and uh, early uh, adolescence in females with ADHD. As a consequence, their symptoms are all over the place. They're much worse. Their symptomatology gets much worse during this time. They have a lot of hyperreactivity, a lot of problems, and it's very difficult to stabilize. As we go on in life, we know the estrogen fluctuates every month. And we also know that it goes up and down depending on whether you're pregnant, depending whether you're on birth control pills. Um, also, as you go into perimenopause, 10 years of around before menopause. So, you know, if we just say roughly 50 is menopause, your estrogen starting to go down at 40. So as your estrogen goes down, your dopamine, serotonin, depression, as it goes down, you're going to see decreasing dopamine, increasing ADHD symptomatology, increasing depression very often, uh, and then the norepinephrine also may follow um, in that same. So what are we going to see? We may see increasing ADHD symptoms prior to menstruation. We may see it after pregnancy. We may see a lot of women report that they are just feeling their best and their ADHD symptoms are not bothering them while they're pregnant and nursing. But as soon as they wean the baby, they're all back again. We may see also that as you go into perimenopause, your symptoms start to get worse. And certainly in menopause, we see women's symptomatology increase. So much so that a lot of women in menopause think they have ADHD now because they have all these symptoms of distractibility, poor attention span, uh, insomnia. They have problems with word recall. Um, direct naming, uh, word naming, etc. So we see these differences in women and we need to treat therefore, since I said men through their 70s and 80s have the same amount of estrogen, what we're seeing is very different profiles for a lot of women. What I have my patients do when I'm, I'm treating them uh, and put them on stimulants is I have them, once we, we see what uh, dose works for them, we then look at what happens through their menstrual cycles and we talk about symptoms twice a day, every day for two consecutive months and see in relation to their period what happens to their ADD symptoms. And that will give us an idea of what we need to do, which we're going to talk about at the end. But I, I now want to talk about um, mainly how this affects um, the women with ADHD. So one of the things that we see is um, we may see worsening uh, of symptomatology uh, because of hormones, fluctuating hormones. The other thing we may see in women is worsening symptomatology. Uh, for a couple of other reasons. First of all, remember I said women are very good at asking for help or getting help from other people. Um, and girls, uh, adolescents are as well. One of the things that I then find very often is if you're living at home, your friends are in your, from your school or your neighborhood, if your mom does the laundry, if your food is on the table, if your bank account you know, is in your dad's pocket or um, you have your own ATM card or whatever, um, you kind of don't have a lot of other things that you have to pay attention to other than school and friends and relationships. So these are the main areas that you're going to focus on. 
um, and you don't have a lot of other things going on. What happens, however, is that individual, whether male or female, with, we're talking about people getting help now and having the symptoms, um, again, remediated, they're very bright, um, they're in maybe tutoring, they have a coach, whatever, you know, things are really go along very well. They may see a psychiatrist, they're on medication, um, so that they built up a system of support and then they go off to college. And what happens is that now they have to get the money, they have to get their food, they have to go grocery shopping, they have to do their laundry, they have to decide who their friends are, if they're going to join this sorority or this one. Uh, how, what am I going to do as far as tutoring is concerned? What am I going to do about a psychiatrist? What am I going to do about going to the... Um, uh, uh, LD program in my class. We know they don't. Do I still take my meds? As a result, we find that a lot of young women with ADHD become severely depressed and have a significant, sometimes their first failure academically as they enter college. So it's very important that we set up a, a program for these women so that they can be successful as they go off to college. So as stressors increase, ADHD symptom symptomatology can get worse as well. And we can't manage it as well as we did before. Very often, you're just fine. You might have done fine through college. You worked very hard. You got a lot of help, et cetera, and things straightened out and, and were fine. Um, you're then a single girl starting a job, a single young woman starting a job. Everything's going pretty well. Then you meet somebody, and then you get married. Well, first of all, then you have to deal with all the re intimate relationship issues, but, you know, you get through that. And you may be able to function for a while. But then you have one, then you have two, then you have three children. And you are no longer able, and maybe one of those children, or two, or all three, have ADHD. So right now, things are looking pretty, pretty bleak, and you can no longer um, really deal with your symptomatology. And at that point, what we see is that women really uh, present themselves, and they give up, and they say, help. Something's wrong with me. I don't know what it is, but something's wrong here. And then they come in and seek a diagnosis. So that's why they're diagnosed pretty late for a lot of these women. A lot of them are diagnosed when their children are diagnosed. You hear about that as well for both males and females. You fill out these forms, and as you fill out the forms, you see that, oh, you know, that's me. So um, you do get the diagnosis. Again, looking at this, when your stressors overcome your ability to cope, and women have a lot of coping strategies that they use, but when the stressors overcome the ability to cope, that's when we see these women coming in for a diagnosis and treatment of the disorder. Now, a lot of things has happen have happened along the way. Um, you know, they, they have a lot of um, difficulty, um, both at home and at, at work and in interpersonal relationships. Um, I remember when um, Desperate Housewives used to be on, and I think her name was Bree, the redhead with the twins. One of them had ADHD. Um, she took her son's medication because she really had to do these Halloween costumes and she couldn't get them done and all of that. And she realized everybody else could do what she couldn't do, so she took some of her son's Ritalin. And I remember that being a huge <clears throat> discussion uh, after the show aired. Um, but I think the issue was that she may have had ADHD um, and that she had a twin with ADHD, one of her twin boys. And um, the other thing that we saw with her um, is that she really felt like she could not keep up and do what other women's, women seemed to be able to do easily. Um, I always said, after that show came out, I always said, women with ADHD are the true desperate housewives. Um, and they really have difficulty because you have to juggle a lot of organizational tasks, you know, meal planning, 
ingredients for the meals, remembering everyone's birthdays, you know, remembering what your kids have to do every day and where everything is. So there's a lot of the issues that really strike at the heart of the ADHD uh, weaknesses. And so it's really, um, again, for women, um, these issues lead to a, a great deal of demoralization, um, imposter syndrome. I've seen a lot of women with ADHD who are professionals come and say, I always, I remember one pediatrician came and she said, I always thought someone was going to come and tap me on the shoulder and say, uh, you really shouldn't be a pediatrician. Um, and I dealt with lots of surgeons who might have been great surgeons. I had one surgeon that I treated who had been um, discharged from two hospitals because she never did her charts. She was a fabulous surgeon, but she never dictated her charts or got any of her paperwork done. Um, so yes, we can be accomplished. Um, many, many years ago, um, <clears throat> um, one of the experts, I won't name him, uh, one of the experts in the field of ADHD said that you couldn't be a doctor and have ADHD uh, because you hadn't failed. I mean, you, had, you were very... Um, proficient and um, you were a professional, um, but that's not the case. Uh, we have found that out as well. Okay, uh, for the last, I want to leave plenty of time for questions. So the last um, area that I want to talk about now that we have a picture of what's going on here, um, the last area I want to talk about is um, treatment and treatment for women. Um, as I've, I've alluded to often throughout this um, uh, presentation, um, ADHD is a neurobiochemical disorder. Um, it's chronic, it affects your functioning, and affects you 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. Some days may be better than others. Um, sometimes you can do something, sometimes you can't. Depends on your stressors, depends on your hormone levels, depends on a lot of things. But you do see that it affects your functioning and does affect uh, relationships. It does affect um, your ability to um, be successful and do things that you want to do. Okay. Um, and since this is really out of our control as far as the symptomatology is concerned, there are, are um, many things we can do to make things better. We can use a coach. We can get organizational strategies. We can have a professional organizer come into our house and help organize it for us. Um, we can, um, I, I, one of the things I think that's really important is address that demoralization and those negative tapes that we have in here um, and those um, self-deflating, um, self-deprecating um, um, loops that we have in our brain uh, by, by working with someone on cognitive behavioral therapy where we can change those scripts uh, that we have inside. I can't do this. I'm not good at anything. Uh, this will never work. This always happens to me. Women with ADHD develop um, a feeling of an external lo locus of control that this life is not in my control. These things always happen to me and I'm not in control. And so we see that and you have to really work on those areas. But just working with all those things, whatever else you might come up with, working on all those things, you still need to fix what's going on in your brain. And for most individuals, that is medication. The medications used to treat ADHD, stimulant class, whether it's methylphenidate or an amphetamine, are very safe and very effective treatments for ADHD. They've been around for a long time. All these new names, all these new formulations are just that. They're formulations. You know, you have short acting and long acting together. You have liquids. You have um, it releasing in a pill in your gut. You have a pro, um, 
uh, mixed with amino acids, so you have a pro-amphetamine, uh, et cetera. Um, these are still stimulants because what we need to do in our brain is turn on the inhibitory system and stimulate the brain to produce more monoamine, dopamine, or block the reuptake of dopamine back into the cell where it's broken down so you have more available. Some people have plenty of dopamine. It's just not available for use. Some people don't have as much. Some people have fewer receptors on the next cell over here. You know, if you have a lot of receptors and a lot of dopamine, that's great. Some people have few receptors and they can have normal amounts of dopamine, but if you don't have a lot of receptors, that re signal is going to be very weak and not work as well or go as fast. So we need to fix that neurobiochemistry. And we do that by using the stimulants to block the reuptake of these um, into the of these um, monoamines back into the cell increase the release and as I said estrogen helps enhance the release so that's one of the things I want to talk about with time okay that's one of the things that I want to talk about quickly in treating women with ADHD one of the things we need to do is to level out their hormone so that they're not having estrogen fluctuations every month so we do put young adult women on oral contraceptives to give them the same amount of estrogen every day. Also, what we do for many of these women, and it's not just women with ADHD, we decrease their, the time uh, between periods. So that we increase the time between periods. So they may go three months without a period with level estrogen, and then <coughs> they're given progesterone and they have a period. So <clears throat> we do do that as far as treating um, ADHD is concerned. I mean, ADHD symptomatology. The other thing we want to look at is hormone replacement therapy. Now, again, this is depending on your individual circumstance. If you've had breast cancer, you may not, um, in discussing with your physician, you may not decide to replace your hormones, and that's a perfectly reasonable decision. But for women who don't have that issue, one of the things we are recommending is that in menopause we replace their hormone levels so that they don't have the estrogen decrease and they don't have increasing ADHD symptomatology and poor functioning and performance. The last thing I want to talk about along those same lines is very often girls and women will tell me that before their period, their symptoms increase, or they'll say, my medicines don't seem to be working as well as they did before. And that's, again, um, what if you go to a physician who's not thinking at hormones, who's not thinking about treating women any differently than men, they'll increase your dose, or they'll say, you know, here, take another one, do this, do that. One of the things you need to look at and then you may be over-medicated other times. So what you need to look at is those monthly charts that I talked about with rating your symptoms around your cycle. And if you need to, what we do for women is very often we will increase their dose of medication right before we see when they have the symptoms increase, right before their period. Some people it's a week, some people it's two weeks, some people it's a couple days before and five days in. Uh, to their period. So we, again, try to customize the treatment based on your symptomatology. So if you're having problems a certain time of the month, we may increase your medicine. We may put you on birth control pills. You may do a lot of other things. Uh, now, you're not going to find many um, physicians who diagnose and treat Hormones. There are some around, but not a lot. Um, so what you'll need to do is to do more reading on this topic and also go to uh, both your gynecologist and your prescribing physician for your stimulants and have them work together on um, creating um, an ideal program for you. Excuse me. <coughs> um, 
Maybe that's a, maybe that's a cue that I'm talking too much. Um, let's take some questions because I, I do want to be able to um, actually address your needs and go back and forth. So let's start with some questions. We'll see what that generates and then maybe we can talk about some other things. Um, Cheryl, do you have questions here or are you in the chat? Hello, um, Irene said that she's, Irene Ward is another board member and she's here tonight and she said that she would be answering. Irene? Hmm. Irene, are you here? Can you unmute? Okay, I will get started. Um, okay. Okay. So here are some questions. <coughs> Comment. Um, I saw Dr. Quinn at a seminar through a resource center and realized my adopted daughter has ADHD. She helped me realize medicine was needed and safe. After going through all this, I realized that I may have ADHD myself. So, um, Good for you. Dr. Quinn was talking about um, let me say one other thing about that. It's Donna or Irene. Oh, Irene, we couldn't get. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Um, okay. Is. Let me say one other thing about that. I think it's really very important. When we were talking about something is wrong with me, I don't know what it is, but I know it's something. Um, I always say to women, Two things. First of all, you need to listen to that little voice inside that's talking to you all the time. Sometimes it's saying not so nice things, but other times it's saying, I, I don't, something's going on here. And you need to listen to that. Um, you also need to realize that this is your life and you need to be a good consumer. Women very often are afraid to question physicians. They're afraid to say, I would like a second opinion or to find enough. I'm afraid I'm going to hurt his feelings if I leave him. You know, he's been, I've been with him for so long. Well, he hasn't helped you or maybe stonewalling you in another area. You know, he's willing to treat your depression, but I don't think. I just gave a workshop the other day and two people said to me about their children, I wasn't talking about adult women, but two people said to me, well, the psychologist said they have a touch of ADHD or they have a tendency, those were the two words they used, a tendency to ADHD. Well, what I said is ADHD is like being pregnant. You either are or you aren't. You don't have a tendency to be pregnant. You don't have a touch of pregnancy. So if you are listening to these symptoms or you're reading about the disorder and you think it might be you, keep going until you get the answers that make sense to you. Uh, and don't be afraid to hurt someone's feelings. You know, they probably, you know, once you're gone, they don't even think about you again. Um, you know, they have 2,000 other patients they're treating. So don't worry about that. But I think that that's really a, a very important thing, particularly for women who often are afraid um, to speak up or to switch physicians or ask for a second opinion. Um, and I think that, again, um, understanding that prescribing medication is an art and not a science. If a physician writes the same prescription for everybody, you need to find another another physician. I mean, I very often say to people, I used to try to choose medication based on the symptoms that I saw in someone. And I think that's, again, very important. You need to say to your physician, you need to question, you need to say, well, why have you chosen this medication? Is it because that was the last you know, drug rep that came in your office? Um, you know, why are you choosing this one? Did you just go to a workshop on it? Very often, I tell women, you know, finding a, um, finding a, a physician to treat and diagnose women is very difficult. And um, I, before you go in, I would ask them, have you diagnosed women with ADHD? 
what books have you read about ADHD in women? Have you gone to seminars on ADHD in women? I mean, I wouldn't want to have someone treating me who hasn't gone to a seminar or read about it or um, done something, you know, if I had diabetes or if I had something else, I wouldn't want someone who knows what they're doing. And so ask questions, interview the doctor. Um, it's really, really very important um, because they don't always have the experience that they need to treat this disorder in women or young girls. And very often, they also just prescribe, certain, a lot of physicians only have one medicine they prescribe for everybody. And I can tell you from doing this for over 50 years, that when I see someone, I have no idea what medicine is gonna work for them. And I have no idea what dose they're gonna working with them. And I just wanna address one other question I get a lot or I hear from people a lot is, I don't want my child to be a zombie, or I don't want to feel, and I say, I don't either. And if your child is a zombie, then the physician who's prescribing that medication needs to change the medication or the dose or do something. You should never be a zombie or feel like your personality has changed or feel like um, I can't function as well as I could function before I started taking this medicine. Absolutely not and you are not on the right medicine, you're not on the right dose, something needs to be changed. And you don't, I mean, when a parent says to me, I don't want my kid to be zombie, I said, you know, they're not supposed to be on this medicine. We're improving functioning, not decreasing. And I think that's important. Okay, Cheryl, you have other questions? Yes. Um, somebody asked, speaking of how to find a doctor, somebody asked, is there a list of doctors who treat adult women with ADHD? Okay, no. <laughs> um, I always refer people to Chad. No. <laughs> um, what I suggest to people is um, ask if, if, you, if you find someone who's diagnosed, ask them who their physician is. Um, the other thing I like to use is um, I have people, uh, you know, no matter where they're living, um, I have them call the Learning Disabilities Resource Center at the nearest university. And I have them ask the people at the Learning Disability Resource Center, where do they send their students who need to be diagnosed or treated with ADHD? Because they're going to have lots of people coming to them on campus, and they're going to have to be evaluated. And they usually have psychiatrists that are, you know, um, on staff or they have local psychiatrists in the community and I would ask them who they find uh, treats uh, their female students with ADHD well and usually they have enough um, female students who are reporting back to what's going on that you'll get some good, some names in the area um, and that helps um, the other thing is to, again, question a lot of the people that I know aren't practicing anymore. Um, and, I, and unfortunately, in this area, it's another, I think it's a, a topic for discussion some night. Um, but we don't have a lot of people coming up who have the same interests that some of the original founders um, in this treating this disorder and, you know, were around in chat in the beginning. Um, they don't have the same... Um, we have a few. Um, we don't have as many, though. And I think that's also what we see out there. Also, a lot of the child psychiatrists, you know, they always say children, adolescents, and adults, and people forget to go to them. So I also find that a lot of information in this disorder in treating um, females, young girls, and adolescents, and so therefore a lot of them um, can uh, really talk about some of the issues that we're talking about, particularly the demoralization, the depression, the other issues um, around ADHD in women, and they do treat women. Um, I know Dr. Nadeau's office, my partner uh, <coughs> out there in, um, I think she's in North Bethesda now, uh, the Chesapeake ADD Clinic. Um, I know they have two physicians there who specialize in uh, women and they do have women's groups. Um, so I think that that's also a good resource in the area. And they're right off 270, so it's not, I mean, just not far to get there from Northern Virginia. Okay, questions? Uh, well, a follow-up question is, are you taking... So we can't hear you. 
Can you? Can anyone hear me? Now we can. Okay, Dr. Quinn, are you? I can hear you. Patients? No, I have retired for the third time. Okay. <laughs> Good try. <laughs> please, yeah. please. I had a big struggle. I had a big struggle with this. My husband would kill me, I think, if I went back to work again. Um, I'm trying. I'm trying to re enjoy my retirement. We've just moved to South Carolina to Hilton Head because my husband feels if I'm down there, I really won't get involved with any of this anymore. Okay, somebody has a recommendation. I have only been able to. Let's see. We use GeoMind DNA blood work to find out medication, which medication worked and which ones did not. Do you know anything about that, Dr. Quinn? I do not. Um, I don't know what they're looking at. Um, you know, I, I don't know anything about it. If it worked for them, fine. If they found a medicine that worked, great. Um, there's lots of things coming. I was hoping at some point we'd be able to do um, genetic testing to diagnose ADHD, but I think that's really not going to happen because of the heterogeneity. I think what we're going to really be left with with this disorder is probably looking at functional MRIs and making the diagnosis based on brain anatomy and um, differences in the brain. There's also, I didn't get into this because I, I didn't find it that important for the length of time we had, but there's also anatomical differences in the brains of males and females, as well as um, hormonal differences, um, so that we find certain areas are different in males and females, resulting in probably their different symptomatology. Um, just one quick example um, is that um, we do see um, for females that the area in the brain responsible, the caudate nuclei, uh, that's, a, that's um, with hyperactive behaviors, um, it's inversely proportional. So the smaller your caudate nuclei, the more hyperactive you are. And when they've done studies looking at males and females, they have found that the caudate nuclei is the largest in females with ADHD, probably why they don't have as much hyperactivity as boys. And why girls in general aren't as hyperactive as boys, because their caudates are bigger. It goes boys with ADHD, boys without ADHD, girls without ADHD, girls with ADHD for size of the caudate nucleus, the largest caudate being in girls with ADHD. So there are, are um, anatomical differences that we can see. Okay. Um, most of the questions actually appear to be comments, so people can look at it if they want. But um, it's not such Well, a let's find another question. Is there more that I missed? Irene, do you see any questions? I don't see any. Um, there was a comment that um, Jane said that her son was 21 and is no longer taking care of his uh, ADHD. Uh, starting in his teens, he definitely showed similar symptoms as women, anxiety, depression, hiding behind his computer, and he took a lot of cruel teasing over the years and still maybe does. Uh, she came tonight because she believes she might have it has never been diagnosed. I've come up with many coping techniques but can't seem to inspire my son. So I guess that's, you know, the dilemma uh, that she has. Is okay. How, how old was her son, 21? Yes. Okay. Um, the first thing about ADHD, whether it's in a child or an adult or um, – whatever, the first, the most important, or the number one, I always say to people, if you, leave, if you don't leave my office with 12 things to do, I haven't done my job. And the number one is always getting educated and informed about ADHD. I find that so often when children are, that's why I wrote Putting on the Brakes. Gosh, I wrote that so long ago. It was the first book for kids. And the reason why it was the first book for kids was I was telling all the kids what was going on, but nobody else was. And I felt, wow, they need a book to tell them what's going on. And that's why I wrote Putting on the Brakes with Judy Stern. Um, what you need to understand all of this before you really can deal with it. And that's very, someone just can't tell you you have ADHD. 
you really need to understand. You need to have your questions answered. You need to talk to other people with the disorder. You need to talk to family members about it. Not be afraid to, I mean, I know so many people over the years who would not tell their in-laws or not tell the grandparents that the child has ADHD. Oh, you know, pe people would come into me, into my office and say to me, Dr. Quinn, you can ADHD. I thought, well, what are you doing here? Um, you know, this, this really had a lot of stigma attached to it for a very long time. It still does, um, unfortunately. Um, but one of the issues is to really have him understand it. Um, I find a lot of females, we're not we're starting to treat them later on because they've been treated for anxiety, they've been treated for depression, and finally we start treating them for their ADHD. But for boys who were treated early, what I find is that they at some point in their adolescence want to come off their medication. Um, the goal of adolescence is to be like everybody else. And if you have to take medication, you're not like everybody else. No matter what disorder you have, if you have diabetes, if you have uh, anything, you're not the same as anybody else, So, uh, as everybody else. So a lot of them want to come off their meds. And I find that as a good teaching opportunity. Um, or for, for a 21-year-old, one of the things after we've discussed the disorder and what they can do about it and how things are going, um, I really ask them to, um, once a support program has been set up, uh, you know, not sitting behind your computer, but really working on some of the things that are going on. Once a support program has been set up, I find it's really useful um, to have that person engage in a trial of medication and have them rate themselves daily, twice a day. Have someone else, have their boss or their college professor or someone they trust rate them, their girlfriend rate them. Oh, I remember. Um, one girl, a lot of people, you know, again, still they only need to take this medication during school and not for relationships. And I had this one um, young woman in college who um, uh, fought with her boyfriend and broke up with her boyfriend every weekend. And she would not take her medicine on the weekend. So finally, one time when we were talking about this, I said to her, um, would you please do me a personal favor? and take your medication this weekend and call me Monday and let me know how it went. So she did and she called me up Monday and she said, it was great. We had a great time and he said I was, <laughs> I was really together and they didn't have a fight and they had a good time and she then understood how ADHD affected her in her interpersonal relationships. I also once had some parents call me who were going to Disney World with their son and uh, they said, should we put him, up? we're going to be at Disney World, you know, this wonderful place, and do we need to medicate him? And I responded, only if you want to have fun, because if you your child standing in two hour lines and eating whatever all day long and don't have him on his medicine, you're going to have a terrible time. And what about the plane? And so, you know, they medicated him in Disney World and they had a, a, a better time than they would have without it. Um, so I think that, again, we need to kind of understand why we're taking the medication. We need to look at the symptoms. We need to treat to effectiveness, not just treat. Treat to, and you know, the goal of ADHD treatment is not to reduce your symptoms. It's to normalize functioning. I'll say that again. The goal of ADH treatment is not just to reduce your symptoms. It's to normalize functioning. So you need to work with somebody who is going to work with you and get feedback from you to see how you're progressing towards that goal. And it's very important. And unfortunately, a lot of people aren't there as far as that's why I'm treating this person. And again, a lot of the, the treatments 
that show if it, these medications work. They are, they're 98% effective. But what does effective mean? A 30% reduction in symptoms. I don't want my symptoms reduced 30%. I want them reduced a lot more than that. Um, so you need to work with someone who will help you. And many, 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 many people. I would say if you're going to use the medicine, use it at the right dose. Many, many people are under-medicated. You can always cut back. But if you don't try a higher dose, you don't know how much more effective it's going to be. Okay, more questions. Uh, there was another question that said, I've heard, whoops, where'd we go? I scrolled up. Uh, I've heard that ADHD can also present with some gender identity issues, like not always internally identifying as fully female. Can you speak to that? And um, no research has been done on that. Um, what we what has been um, looked at occasionally is that ADHD does occur um, in individuals who have gender identity issues, or in people who um, are gay uh, or lesbian. Um, so, as I said, it's an equal opportunity disorder. Um, I wouldn't say it would cause you to have gender um, identity issues. Um, I'm certainly, I'm sure people who have gender identity issues have ADHD. Um, I think like eating disorders in individuals with ADHD, a lot of it is the result of anxiety and some other problems. Um, and we see that a disorders, that it's someone with ADHD and anxiety. And once you treat the ADHD and anxiety, the eating disorders go away. I'm not saying that about gender identity issues, but I'm just saying um, that we can see this in uh, individuals with a lot of other diagnoses. Here's someone here. <laughs> uh, also, there, just to add a little bit, and also, how does one identify ADHD in gifted women with good masking characteristics? In, in my 30s and just got diagnosed, but I don't even know how to separate masking behaviors from just how I operate now because I don't know what's neurotypical um, mental day-to-day -day processes look like. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, that's what we've been talking about a lot tonight, that, um, that women with ADHD have built up all these other characteristics to really help them. I think, though, what you need to do is we have a uh, – it's online somewhere, and it's in our book. It's called the SASI, the Self-Assessment Scale for – Symptom Scale. It's, it's called SASI, Self-Assessment Symptom Inventory for Women. <laughs> And um, what uh, it doesn't have a, a, a baseline. If you're over this, you have ADHD, and if you're under, what it has are diagnostic cutoff. What you have in that is really a way to target symptoms that are your that are your particular symptoms, and then look for symptom reduction with treatment. Um, one of the things, though, that I think it's really important is to take some sort of an inventory and say, where am I having these difficulties? And, you know, what can I do about them? You know, if it's, if it's organizational, medication's not going to help you with your organizational skills per se. You need to get an organizational symptom. Now, this woman may have a great organizational system, but she spends too much time doing it. Mm -hmm. And so she needs to assess that. Um, so I think that that's where, again, you need to look at how it's affecting you personally, even how your coping mechanisms that you've developed uh, and the systems that, you, that you've developed, like the woman who vacuumed all the time, and that wasn't an appropriate coping mechanism. Um, again, I don't know specifically what this woman is talking about, but I would do an inventory and look at, um, strengths and weaknesses. For me, obviously, I, when I was in medical school, um, is when I first realized I had ADHD. Now, I, we have a lot of ADHD in my family, and ADHD wasn't even being diagnosed when I was in medical school. Um, but um, I realized that I had to continually reread because I lost my place because I wasn't paying attention. And I realized it took me a lot longer um, to do certain things than it did other people, medical students. I mean, I stayed up till 2 o'clock. Other 
thing that I realized was um, that I also developed some compensatory, because of my intelligence, um, I had developed some, like, for example, underlining um, or doing other things that really helped me. Um, but that's what I'm talking about. Look at, at what you need to do. Now, people say to me, oh, you're a very functional um, person right now, blah, blah, blah. And I would say, ask my husband. <laughs> about, I remember we were driving several years ago, and I um, started up a conversation. We had been in about three days before. And he said, where did that come from? And I said, look, we've been married 52 years. Not then. Now we are. But I said, look, we've been married for a long time. Don't ask me where that came from. Um, you know, it just was pulled out of the sky. And that, I mean, you know, but that's how my ADHD comes out. I mean, you know, I'm very internally distracted. And we can be talking about something. And I am five steps to the left or you know hopscotching around inside my brain it's like a ping pong i always describe it it's like a um one of those arcade machines where the balls go all around and hit everywhere mm -hmm. you know so again and then i grab one of those thoughts and i start talking about it again and everyone goes oh where did that come you know i'm a very bright person but um you can see my adhd well i've been talking all night here um, you can see my ADHD symptoms other ways. Um, so I think that what you need to do is to then try to deal um, with your symptoms and maybe your coping strategies which have not served you very well. Very, that was very good. Um, another question is, is there a lot of overlap of symptoms with ASD? And, yes. Uh, is it possible to tell whether, uh, for example, the impulsiveness and hyperactivity is ADHD related in a girl already diagnosed with ASD? Um, there's no way to tell other than treatment. Um, you know, when, when we started in the field, um, when I started as a developmental pediatrician in, in 1971, um, I tried to cover that up. But anyway, um, you could not have a developmental disability and ADHD. You could not, well, we didn't even have autism spectrum disorder back then. We had autism and, and it was a completely different diagnosable syndrome. Um, but for many years, you couldn't have uh, ASD and ADHD. People were saying, no, 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 no. Now there are books written on it, and yes, you can, uh, and it's changed. So I think that that's, um, I find a lot of my female patients with ADHD um, do have ASD as well, or are diagnosed with ASD as well, and I find that those are the most difficult to treat with medication. So I think your ADHD does need to be treated, but I think it needs to be treated very carefully. And um, I had the most success with some of my patients um, when the patch came out, when, you know, these different delivery systems, mm -hmm. um, also using some of the non-stimulants with the, some of these girls with um, uh, ASD. So I think, um, we see a lot of the overlap of symptoms, and I think we need to treat it. Uh, we need to, to try to get a balance with sometimes a couple medications. Um, and that's another thing um, that just popped into my head. Um, we were talking about having primary anxiety or primary depression in addition to your ADHD or bipolar and ADHD or whatever. They both need to be treated. They all need to be treated. So for many women with ADHD, they need to be treated with antidepressants and stimulants. And for some of them with OCD-like tendencies, they may need something for their OCD. So again, you need to, to customize the treatment to the patient. And I think that's very, very, very important. And But I will say this, it is difficult to treat um, I think a lot of these girls with spectrum disorder and their ADHD to just get it right with the medication. Mm -hmm. uh, another question was, I'm menopausal, I'm a menopausal woman, uh, having trouble concentrating, remembering you know, things, and some attention issues. How do I know whether it's ADD or whether it's hormonal? 
Okay, well, if you had it all your life, it's ADD. Okay. <laughs> if it just started a few years ago, it, um, Tom Brown and a group have done several studies uh, with Vivance and women without ADHD who are having menopausal cognitive symptoms of menopause. And they found that it works just as well for those women. So it really doesn't matter whether you have ADHD or not. The treatment with a stimulant will improve your symptomatology. And so I think that's, again, very important to understand for some of these women. You know, sometimes they won't treat you unless they give you an ADHD diagnosis. Fine, diagnose me and treat me so I can function better. And I think that's very important. And also, hormone replacement therapy improves cognitive uh, functioning for women uh, in menopause. So you need to kind of think about that. Yeah, and the comment, the follow-up comment was that um, she is on Vyvanse. Ben, yes. made an incredible difference. Another one was, uh, just a comment. Did you say she, there's quite a difference on Vyvanse? Yes, yes, yeah. positive difference. Um, yeah. Until tonight, I didn't even put two and two together that rereading parts of a book could be an ADHD thing. Thank you. That's exactly the kind of thing I need to explore. So it is funny that some people don't even realize that they have it right? Um, until they hear it described as you're doing tonight. Um, there was another question that a mom asked, how can I help my daughter regulate her emotional reactions when she's overwhelmed? She begs to die. She's only 13, although these moments might only occur once a month. I worry about when she's older and suffers rejection that she'll harm herself. She sees psycho a psychologist. But, it, but it's not on meds. She's uh, trialed three meds, but to severe side effects. So, like, where do you begin? Oh, dear. Um, I'm really, you know, got we got to get this going. Um, first of all, you need, do need to look at when um, her emotional outbursts happen. Now, there may not be any pattern to them, especially since she's 13. Um, but we do see hyper um, reactivity um, in um, girls this age who have ADHD. So I'm not surprised. Um, as far as um, the rejection and all of that, I agree with you. Um, I think she should probably be on something for her depression, herself um, uh, wanting to self-harm, et cetera. I mean, it sounds like she's uh, seeing someone, and I think you should discuss that with them um, and see about putting her on some uh, kind of medication for that. As far as her ADHD is concerned, um, I don't know what the side effects are, but I always said if a medication is effective, we usually don't stop the medication for side effects. We try to work with the... For example, there are a lot of girls who get stomach aches when they take their medication. And um, what I had them do is make sure they eat and then take their medication. There's also medication now in patch form, which does not go through the GI tract. It goes right into the bloodstream. So if you're having stomach aches because of the stimulant in your stomach causing spasms, you can, you know, not deal with that. Um, so there's a lot of things we can do to help with some of the side effects um, for medication. And um, I think that that's, again, she needs to work with someone who can start at low doses, who can help um, do a trial and error with the various medications to see what will work, to see how they can alleviate some of the side effects. Um, for example, if people have so much anorexia that they don't eat, at all and start losing weight. It's always the skinny kids who don't eat on the stimulants. Um, if you maintain the same number of calories, they will not lose weight. So you need to work on maintaining caloric intake with them and you need to teach them some nutritional choices, etc. Um, that help. So I don't know what her side effects were, whether they were headaches or stomach aches or not eating or whatever. Um, and some children have behavioral reactions. I've seen children on, on um, amphetamines cry a lot, and you put them on a methylphenidate, and they don't cry. Uh, so you have to just see what works with that. And, and again, it's not knowing specifically 
Um, it's hard to make any recommendations, but just that general recommendations. And um, I really wish you luck. It's, it's really going to be very important. I'm so glad that you're aware of this, that you're working on it. Um, and I would think about um, you know, talking with someone about all of this again. It's very important. You may want um, a good child psychiatrist to discuss the treatment with you. Uh, can I go back to this question on the uh, geno genome mind DNA blood? Sure. Because I I don't know that much about it, but I some of the clients that I work with, they've had probably this type of blood work, and they found that um, their children weren't metabolizing properly some of the meds that they were on. They weren't oh. really even working for their bodies properly, and right. they whatever I don't know if this is the same thing. Donna, if you're still with us, maybe you could comment. Yes, maybe she can explain it. But I, I, there are individuals who are fast metabolizers, rapid metabolizers. And those individuals need, I mean, I can remember years and years ago, and this was, again, through trial and error. I had to keep increasing. Most people get on a dose and it works for them. And like with, um, there's kind of like your dose. <laughs> And, you know, for like the, some of the women, we increase it for a few weeks and then go back down again. But what I found with individuals, and most of them I don't have to keep going up and up and up when you gain weight. This is not a, like an antibiotic where you do it by how much you weigh. Um, this is what works in your brain. And what we found is there were a group of, of individuals, and we didn't have genomic testing or DNA testing. So what we found is we increased their dose. And then the, de the amphetamines were no longer effective. So we put them on a methylphenidate, and then you'd increase the dose, and you'd keep going like that forever. Um, and they were just really rapid metabolizers. I was uh, uh, referred patients from a study at NIH once, because these are kids who are on huge doses of stimulants that no one would treat them. And they needed that much. Um, to effectively treat their symptomatology, and they were very, usually very, very hyperactive to the point where they were doing dangerous, impulsive things um, that were dangerous. Um, so they needed treatment, and um, most people wouldn't treat to the amount that we were treating them, and, and um, I always used to kid that the DEA had a special file on me. Uh, for, because I only prescribed stimulants my entire practice. Um, I don't prescribe antibiotics. I don't prescribe, you know, I prescribe antidepressants and atypicals and, uh, and uh, other things, but I don't prescribe, um, I'm not, I'm only treating the, this disorder. Um, but it was really important to understand that some people, not everybody, but some people do need a unique dose of the medication. And maybe that's what this is again referring to. I know, um, when you do the um, spec scans, again, medications are recommended based on what areas um, of the brain um, that they see lit up in the spec scan. And I know there's one in Northern Virginia, isn't there one of... Um, I think the Amen Clinic is one of them. That's what I mean, the Amen Clinic there in Northern Virginia, yeah. Um, it, and I imagine it's, you know, it, you see certain things and you prescribe certain things for it. But again, rapid metabolizers do exist and they do need different doses of medication. Mm -hmm. <coughs> no, okay. One, one, one comment that Ginny had made was that, just, you know, switching docu doctors helped. Uh, and, and in these cases, as a female, it helps to have a female doctor. Um, um, yes. You just build that level of trust. Yes. Um, and I think you really want someone who, um, who un understands in a way. I'm going to give you an example of what happened to me. I went to an OBGYN conference here in D.C. Uh, when the WHO study came out about the hormones and breast cancer and all of that, and everyone was off their hormones and da-da-da-da-da. And during a break, you know, and the men were saying, oh, no, you know, we're talking about medication for gynecology, um, for um, urinary, um, to present urinary tract infections and to help with cognitive functioning and all this. Anyway, I went in the ladies' room, fortunately. There were a lot of female OBGYNs in there. Uh, well, they were all female OBGYNs except for me. And as we're waiting in line, as you usually do in the ladies' room, I, since I am impulsive and can call out, I said, will anyone raise their hand who are on um, hormone replacement therapy in here in the ladies' room? And they all raised their hand. 
So these are our OBGYNs who are taking all their patients off these medications, but they themselves were staying on it. Now we know that that's not a good study, and this, you know, uh, and a lot that's that's been debunked. But um, you know, even at that point, these women knew that it was better for them than people were letting on. And I think again, in dealing with the women who see the issues about going on. Mm -hmm. uh, and all of this, it's it, 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 an R off or their ADD symptomatology worsening. I mean, I think an OBGYN would believe you when you said the week before my period, this and this and this happened. I mean, we know right. now about premenstrual mood disorders and et cetera. And it's the same thing. This is premenstrual magnification of ADD symptomatology. Um, so we, uh, in my book, we kind of named it that. Mm -hmm. um, but it's the same thing that you see with the other um, monoamine serotonin. I mean, you see it with serotonin, we see it with dopamine. It makes sense. You know, no one's making all this up uh, as far as what we're seeing in, in the thing. Um, and one, one uh, person commented that she saw you at a seminar through a resource center um, and realized that her adopted daughter had ADHD. So she said you helped her really determine what medicine was needed and what was, what was safe. Good. You know, that was a nice specific compliment. Yes, and to hear, to hear something back, yes. I always, one of the things I always do is someone says, well, I remember when you said, and I always go, oh, please, what did I say? Yeah. Uh, always good to hear something that helped. That's wonderful. Does anybody else have any questions before we're, we wrap it up here? Uh, Oh, uh, uh, Terry was a teen. I don't know how I would have coped in the world of smartphones and social media as a kid. I found the right counselors helped me when I was older. Uh, transactional analysis and CBT. Yeah. Absolutely, yes. Yeah. Um, so any other, this is fantastic tonight. There's so much more we could be talking about. We could talk to you for another hour. Yes, I always say it's very hard to put into one hour and I have to really discipline myself with my phone here um, because I give full day workshops on this, you know, it's. Well, this is very informative. We really, really appreciate you taking the time to support our, our organization. I, ha I, was at, I was at the first CHAD conference. Well, that's exciting. Yes, I was with Harvey Parker and lots of other people. Well, there weren't a lot of people, but we were there. Well, we admire you and your partner, uh, Kathleen. She's been great supporting yes. the organization as well. So we will reach out to you probably again. Okay. Another. Next time, maybe from next time, maybe from South Carolina. There you go. Cheryl, do you have right. any comments or anything? I'm sorry, I'm sitting in the dark. I didn't turn my light on because it was light when I sat down. That's all right. No, I, be, I just want to say, the, the, I always try to end with this. Things can get better. And this is a hopeful diagnosis. But you need to reach out there and get people to listen to you. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm hoping that you all can do that. Get yourself educated, read some books, you know, go and get the literature, um, but then, you know, present it to the physicians and say, look, I need help and, you know, don't take no for an answer. Mm -hmm. And I hope all your electricity comes back on, all of you. There you go, I know. Well, thank you very much. We really appreciate 